June 2004 What should be the best day of a man's life turns into his very worst. As his dear wife pushes, squeezes, rips, and grips onto the side of a bed, this 33-year-old man sees something that's just too much to take. The upside? A healthy baby and a safe wife. But unfortunately, a dead husband. We guess the moral of this story is watching someone give birth isn't for everyone. But what exactly killed the guy? What did he see that was so upsetting or shocking that he ended up dead? Let's first go back to the start, the act we call making love. The truth is, despite humans treating it like a beautiful miracle, for most people it isn't all that hard to become banged up. Here's the proof. Britain's NHS warns that if you have sex without contraception, a woman can become pregnant at any stage during her menstrual cycle. But what's a menstrual cycle? The cycle begins with phase 1 menstruation, aka the period. This is when a female's uterus, a hollow pear-shaped organ between her rectum and bladder that's part of her reproductive system, sheds its lining, which then flows out of her vagina. This collection of blood, mucus, and cells leaves her for three to seven days. From one period to the next is the entire menstrual cycle, with an average length of 28 or 29 days. But this differs with age and other factors. It might last from 23 to 35 days. A woman's body begins to make an egg, and when it's mature it's released from her ovary and heads along something called a fallopian tube toward her uterus. This is where it waits for sperm. This process is called ovulation, and it can last anywhere between 16 and 32 hours. It happens about two weeks before her period. The egg hangs around there for about 24 hours, waiting for that little sperm to make the hard journey up through her body after it's entered through her anterior vagina. There's something called the luteal phase, when her uterus walls thicken to prepare for a pregnancy. If the egg isn't fertilized, those walls are released. This is the period. A woman can get pregnant at any time during her menstrual cycle, but she's at her most fertile, of course, during the ovulation part. That's her egg saying, come on, you guys, I can't wait around forever. You should also know that sperm can live inside her body for up to seven days, so it might be waiting there for her to ovulate. It's not that it's conscious, hiding in dark corners ready to spring into action, it just sort of happens, it's kind of evolutionary magic. Girls usually start their periods at about the age of 12, but can start as young as 8. The periods often stop in their early 50s. This is called menopause. If she starts at 12 and has periods until she's 52, she'll have about 480 of them in total. During this time, the menstrual cycle will cause a variety of hormonal changes, fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone, which can cause moodiness and irritability. A girl might even ovulate without having had her first period. Unbelievably, the youngest person ever to get pregnant was a Peruvian girl named Lina Marcela Medina de Jurado, who gave birth in 1939 at the age of 5 years, 7 months, and 21 days. Her sex organs had matured early, something known as precocious puberty. She had surgery, a cut on her abdomen to get the baby out. This is known as a cesarean section. The reason for this was that her pelvis wasn't developed enough for childbirth. You'll understand more on this as we go through the show. The child grew up healthy, although the identity of the father was never discovered. According to UNICEF, data from 2015 to 2021, about 1 in 6 females give birth before they're 18 in the world in that time period. It was 1 in 4 in Sub-Saharan Africa, the region with the highest rate of teenage pregnancies. As for the West, UNICEF said Britain leads the way in Western Europe in terms of how many girls aged 15 to 19 give birth. The rate was 11 per 1,000. The rate in the US was about 13 per 1,000. India was 12 per 1,000, and China was 6 per 1,000. Most of South America was over 50 per 1,000, and much of Africa was 100 to 150 per 1,000. Canada was 7, Mexico 71, and Australia 9. When a guy ejaculates into a woman's vagina, he might release anywhere from 1 and a quarter to 5 milliliters of semen, about a quarter to 1 teaspoon. This goo contains many things, but most importantly the life-giving sperm. One ejaculation might produce anywhere from 40 to 500 million sperm. They all want to reach the egg, the literal race of a lifetime. Some move straight forward, some move around in circles, and some so-called non-progressive ones can go anywhere but forward. The immodal ones don't go anywhere at all. As we said, some live up to 7 days, so it's not much of a triathlon, but more like an Iron Man. That's an apt comparison because there's iron in the semen. There are many nutrients in this life-giving goop, including lactic acid, magnesium, potassium, and importantly fructose and glucose, every Iron Man's best friend. It's these nutrients that help the sperm get to the egg, along with the woman's uterus muscles, which are also trying to push the sperm onward. These are rough figures, but it's thought only about 2 million sperm will make it as far as the woman's cervix. Let's call that the first checkpoint, or ground zero. 
Only about 1 million get to the uterus, which is a tricky part of the trial. Let's call this one the ice fall. Only about 10,000 make it to the top of the uterus, where it seems many get a kind of hypoxia from the altitude, because only about half of them then head in the right direction, if only sperm had Google Maps. The 5,000 left get to the uterotubal junction. This is the death zone, since only about 1,000 will get to the next part, the fallopian tube. Just when they thought they made it, they hit a kind of hillary step, and only around 200 get to the egg. The journey is not over. Only one sperm from those 200 or so gets to plant his flag in the egg. The whole process might have been as fast as 45 minutes, but it might also be as much as 12 hours. And if the sperm is one of those hardcore tortoises, not a hare, it might be the one that waits as long as seven days. Once there, it fuses with the egg. They fall in love. They are attached forevermore. You might be wondering, what are the chances of you having sex one time and your partner or one night stand becomes pregnant? The simple answer is it could happen that one time, but studies have shown there's about a 1 in 20 chance for healthy young people when they have sex. As we said, there's a much higher chance when she's ovulating. So the great adventurer, the winner of the race, the champ, has fused with the egg. This is called fertilization. It's when the real magic happens. The fertilized egg grows into a ball of cells called the blastocyst. The early stage of the embryo. The cells are now dividing and reproducing. This embryo reaches the uterus after three or four days, where it floats for a couple days, and then attaches itself to the uterine lining. This is called implantation, when the body starts churning out many hormones to create life. It's thanks to these hormones that a woman can take pregnancy tests. According to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the National Institutes of Health, implantation is when pregnancy officially begins, maybe nine to ten days after fertilization. The inner cells are the embryo, and the outer cells that have burrowed into the walls are the placenta. They'll work in tandem to make a complete human that can survive in the outside world. The organs start to develop about three weeks after fertilization. You've got the ectoderm that contributes to the nervous system, skin, mouth, anus, and hair, the mesoderm for the musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, and kidneys, and the endoderm is for the respiratory and digestive systems. We won't get too technical here, otherwise this video will take all day. After about 10 weeks after fertilization, the organs are pretty much formed. We can now call the embryo the fetus. The brain and the spinal cord keep developing as time goes on. After around 14 weeks, the sex of the child is evident. Facial features are being shaped, bones are ossifying, becoming bony, the kidneys are making pee-pee, and the fetus is starting to swallow. It's around 21 to 24 weeks that the fetus is now what we'd call viable, meaning it has a chance to survive in the outside world. On July 5, 2020, a woman in the U.S. had the most premature baby in recorded history. It was born after 21 weeks and one day, or 148 total days, weighing just 14.8 ounces, just under one pound. He had a 1% chance of survival, but he beat the odds, and as far as we can see, is alive and well today. Usually, it's only around week 29 that the fetus accumulates body fat, the stuff that we'll likely spend 80 years trying to lose. The bones get harder, it can respond to stimuli like sound, and its lungs have matured in a few more weeks. At about week 33 to 36, its head engages with the woman's pelvic cavity. This is something called baby dropping. But the real term is lightening. There's no exact time limit for this. It might happen weeks before birth or even just hours before. The baby starts kicking more closer to the birth. If it could speak, it might be saying something like, Let me out of here! There's not enough space! If you're wondering how it's even alive in such a confined space, it's that wonderful organ, the placenta, that provides nutrients and oxygen. Okay, we're almost ready for takeoff. The baby has dropped. The woman's cervix has started to soften and dilate. She's feeling contractions more often, meaning the muscles of her uterus relax and tighten. This is how that little guy gets pushed out eventually. The contractions come on in waves, giving the woman and her baby some much-needed rest periods. There's no hard and fast rule for exactly when things will happen. Every pregnancy has its own thing going on. But it's usual in the first stage of labor for a woman's waters to break. This means that all the fluid-filled membranous sac called the amniotic sac, something that's been cushioning the kid, breaks. The head of the child likely does the breaking in this case. It can gush or it can trickle out, but if it does the latter, it might feel like peeing on yourself. The water should be yellowish. If it's green, it might mean problems. About 7 out of every 10 women give birth within 24 hours of their water breaking. And just about all women, 90% will give birth within the next 48 hours. Sometimes, waters break surprisingly early, so it can come as a bit of a shock. Here are some real-life stories. My water broke while we were watching the boat scene on the Chocolate River in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Mine broke while I was stepping up into an upright freezer in a store. 
I was sitting in the car waiting to enter the resort when my water broke. It's now that her contractions are coming thick and fast. She might feel nauseous, but she's probably been feeling that way for ages now. She might have cramps. This is called active labor. The transitional part. The baby will usually be born in the next 4 to 8 hours. Now her cervix is dilating at a rate of about 1 centimeter an hour. By this time, the woman has already lost something called the mucus plug. This is a collection of mucus that's been sealing the opening of her cervix, preventing nasty bacteria from getting in there. Prior to active labor, it falls out, maybe into the toilet where it might look like the bloody snot of Charlie Sheen in his wilder days. Oh, we apologize for that. Let's move on. The contractions, sometimes incredibly painful, might last even longer than 8 hours, sometimes they last up to 18 hours. The first pregnancy is usually longer than subsequent ones. The cervix is going to have to open around 10 centimeters for the baby to pass through. This is referred to as fully dilated. We humans have very big heads to accommodate our big brains, which is good, or we'd still be hanging out in the trees and having poop throwing fights. But the downside is that our head needs to get through that very small opening. Women have described it as pooping out a pineapple without the sharp bits, of course. The pain level can be low, slightly challenging, hardcore, or screaming your head off and swearing to God that you'll never ever put yourself through this again. The midwife will help the woman find a comfortable position for when the baby's ready to come out. This could be all kinds of positions, including kneeling, squatting, or even standing, supported by the staff and maybe the partner if he's not already passed out. As you'll soon see, some men are not so good with childbirth. Now she has to push the little blighter out. It's got to go through the birth canal to her vagina, an organ that'll almost always tear on the first birth, but to varying degrees of severity. Often the skin and muscles between the vagina and the anus, the perineum, is cut, but that will be stitched up later. The average baby's head at the time of birth is 34 and a half centimeters in circumference, about the same size as a medium-sized cantaloupe or a large grapefruit. That's why childbirth might entail some snipping. Things can get complicated when the baby is lying sideways in the birth canal. This is called traversing, but the doctor would already know the baby is traversed and has already tried to coax it out of this position. A woman can't give birth like this via the vagina otherwise. She and her baby risk death or very serious complications. So if the stubborn horizontal baby can't be moved, there will be a cesarean section. Only 2 to 13% of babies are in a difficult position at the time of delivery. Also uncommon is the breech position, which means feet first. Again, the doctors will try to move the baby, but if that's not possible, a C-section is in the cards. About 3 to 5% of women will have a breech baby at weeks 37 to 40. Right, so here comes the choo-choo through the tunnel. The head comes out, and the rest follows. Its airways are cleared if needed, and if all looks good, the umbilical cord will be cut and clamped soon after. The clamping of the cord doesn't happen until every last bit of blood has left, as this is good for the baby's health. Although if it's wrapped around the baby's head, it'll be cut sooner. While the mother is now feeling great relief, there is more to be done. The placenta has to come out. It usually does so within about 30 minutes, but it could take an hour. Some women have described this as like passing a giant stream of jello. It's not painful, although there might be mild contractions. The midwife pulls the cord, and in turn that pulls the placenta through the vagina. If there's excessive bleeding or the placenta seems stubborn, it can be easily managed. The placenta will not come out in only 2-3% of births, but medical staff should be able to sort that out. If for some reason it's left in there, there's a high risk of bleeding and infection. Since it is still attached to the uterine wall, you have to be careful not to pull out the uterus. Just imagine now how dangerous having a child was in the Middle Ages. Okay, so how is the husband the witness to all this screaming, tearing, slicing, and oozing of nature's most cherished protective gloop? What he's certainly not doing is something that some other mammals do, which is eating the placenta or placentophagy. In some cultures, humans might consume it, but not a slurpee when it's fresh, when it's cooked. They think it's good for them, but there's no science to back that up. You really don't need any placenta soup, but it also won't harm you. Back to the husband. Hopefully he's not in a hospital bed himself, recovering from something his brain is translated as a cross between the exorcist and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Many men do indeed find childbirth horrific. According to a British survey of 1,000 women, 5% of their male partners fainted during their childbirth. A paper published by the National Institutes of Health explained, it is estimated that approximately 13% of expectant fathers experience a pathological and debilitating fear of childbirth. That's kind of funny, given these days it's said 96% of dads in the developed world are there for the birth of their child. Statistically, only 87% of them don't hate every minute of it. 
However, according to our research, many men only faint during the epidural, the injection of a local anesthetic into the partner's spinal nerves in their lower back. It's thought that 20 to 30% of adults have a needle phobia. That's what happened to the guy in the intro video. He passed out during the epidural, fell back, banged his head on the wall, and died. We can't finish on such a grim note, so here's a story from an American woman whose husband sat on the floor when she was in agony, kneading his hand as she got his epidural. She wrote on Reddit, He explained later that he thought it would make less of a scene to just sit on the floor, then pass out or puke all over the nice clean delivery room. Fair enough. Now you need to watch How an Erection Works, or have a look at weird facts about the male body you didn't know.